Um, so like I said, my name is Lindsay Hartzell. Um, I work here at Emory. I'm also the Director of Undergraduate Medical ed Education here. And this is the first one of our virtual lecture series that we're gonna be hopefully continuing on for the next couple of months. Um, our plan is to have, as I mentioned in the email that went out yesterday, our plan is to have two lectures per week with the majority of those being live. And um, each time there will be either a resident or a faculty member to give a little bit of information about themselves, but then to also give a lecture about some urologic topic and then give a chance for questions at the end. So really it's the, our hope is that it's an opportunity for you all to get to know us as a department better, um, uh, learn something about urology as well, but just uh, because obviously times are different this year as far as the interview process is concerned. And so we wanna just, as much as we can, um, come up with different ways for us to stay engaged and to help you all to know more about us as a program. So, as I mentioned, my name is Lindsay Hartzell. Um, I am uh, finishing up my third year on staff here. I was here one year before that, um, doing my uh, fellowship in reconstructive urology. Before that, I am from Tennessee originally. So I spent the majority of my life in Knoxville and then moved to Memphis for both medical school and residency. After leaving there, I came here and, as I mentioned, did a fellowship and then stayed on uh, as faculty. And I currently uh, work both at the Emory University site with the residents, and then we have just recently started working at another hospital, um, Emory Midtown, and I am gonna, I'm going to be spending some of my time there as well. Uh, my practice currently is a combination of both male and female reconstruction, so I enjoy um, and do a lot of things like urethroplasties and male urethral reconstruction. I um, also do a lot of fistula and radiation work, urinary diversions, um, neurogenic bladder, buried penises, kind of all that stuff. So um, like I said, just a, a wide range of reconstructive procedures, prosthetics as well. Um, and, um, and yeah, so there are three of us here doing reconstruction right now. Um, actually four of us, so myself, Dr. Carney, Dr. Galloway, and then Dr. Hammett. Um, so we have a, a pretty, um, a pretty uh, um, complete, I think a pretty uh, a good combination of, of reconstruction, uh, your reconstructive urologists represented here. So that's a little bit about me. Um, you know, I think some of the, the best things about Emory as a department, um, are that, you know, one as for training is that, you know, we have a large faculty, we have all of the subspecialties represented, which I think is really important. Um, it is, it's a really good group of people. I um, have felt very lucky um, to be working with the people that I am, who I can genuinely say are friends of mine as well as colleagues. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the camaraderie here that we ha share as faculty members and with the residents has, is really um, uh, one of, the, one of the, uh, the best things about the program. So um, that's a little bit about me and just a little bit about Emory. Um, so what we'll do is next we're going to get started on the lecture for today, which is about renal trauma. Um, if you have any questions during the lecture, feel free to raise your hand you know, whatever, and we'll stop. And then at the end, I'll open it up for a few minutes for questions, either about Emory, myself, or what we talked about today, and then we'll go on from there. <clears throat> I don't have anything to disclose. So just to go through, we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy, background. We'll talk about the grading scale for renal trauma, a little bit about the AUA guidelines, and then focus on some research that has looked into um, conservative versus operative management, um, some of the follow-up afterwards, and then, um, and then we'll close out after that. Um, in background, so in abdominal trauma, urologic organs are involved about 10% of the time, and of those urologic organs, the kidney is the one that's most commonly injured. Blunt trauma is more common than penetrating, and as you would imagine, the, the causes of blunt trauma are usually car wrecks, but then also falls, sports inju injuries, um, uh, pedestrian injuries, altercations. And then regarding penetrating trauma, gunshot wounds and stab wounds are the two main um, 
causes of penetrating trauma with gunshot wounds being more common than stab wounds. And um, one of the differences is that with gunshot wounds and stab wounds or penetrating trauma that you do often see associated other abdominal imaging, or excuse me, injuries. We'll talk a little bit more about the grading here in just a, in a minute, but this just shows you kind of from the beginning that low grade injuries are much more common than high grade injuries. So high grade being grade four, grade five, make up only 15% of the total renal trauma. For patients who undergo um, exploration, nephrectomy is very common. And so, and like I mentioned, what we're gonna focus on through this talk, or a large portion of it is just the management of renal trauma and how it has shifted um, from an operative approach to a more conservative approach um, over the, the last several decades. Very briefly, anatomy, I know you all already know this, um, but just shows the relationship of the, of the vessels, seeing the renal vein, the renal artery behind it, and then the renal pelvis with the ureter um, going down um, towards the bladder. And so these are the things that we're looking for. You know, the parenchyma can be injured, the collecting system can be injured, the blood supply to the kidney can be injured. Those are all the things we're gonna be talking about uh, throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, so how a patient presents with renal trauma, as you can imagine, so when the patient comes in with any sort of trauma, the first things you're going to be doing are assessing the, for the patient's stability, um, so doing the ABCs, and after you know that the patient is stable, then we're, our next thought is what was the mechanism of injury, because what you'll see is that a lot of times this renal trauma from blunt injuries is associated with a significant acceleration, deceleration, um, you want to see what type of what type of mechanism? Sorry, I was admitting someone else. What type of mechanism um, that uh, that caused the trauma? And then after that, um, looking for certain signs on physical exam, things like hematuria, flank ecchymosis, as you can see in that one picture. Um, and I think it's important to note that while hematuria is common in patients who have renal trauma, it certainly is not always present, and you can't base the degree of renal trauma on the degree of hematuria. So as you can see in this picture on here, pretty significant hematuria, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a worse renal injury than if somebody had you know, either microscopic or not quite as dark of urine. So. <clears throat> Indications for imaging. So moving on from that, who, who needs to get imaging uh, bef you know, after a trauma? So penetrating trauma um, in patients uh, who are likely to have a renal injury. So that's going to be, and, and in general, all these people are going to get imaging, but for you to be thinking about, you know, is this in the mid-axillary line? You know, where is it? Is this close to where the kidneys are? And so that's going to prompt you to, um, to want to move forward with imaging. Blunt trauma, like I said, that has significant acceleration, deceleration, microhematuria with hypotension, pediatric patients, even if they um, don't have hypotension, so if they have microscopic hematuria, um, just because in pediatric patients, they're less likely to be hypotensive, even um, if they have lost some of their vascular um, volume. Um, the imaging you're going to get is a CT scan with um, arteriovenous and delayed images. And so the delayed images are very important because those show you the, the ureters and the collecting system. So not only do you want something that assesses the kidney um, for any sort of um, uh, a hematoma or parenchymal laceration, but you also want to be able to, um, to, to assess the collecting system as well. If the patient is not stable enough for imaging, um, then there are things you can do in the operating room to, um, to further assess for stage of in imaging, or excuse me, stage of uh, uh, injury. So this is the AAST um, grading scale. Uh, you probably, some of you all are familiar with it already, but it basically starts with the lowest grade injury and moves up to the highest. And the distinctions are gonna be, you know, whether there is any laceration into the kidney. If there is a laceration into the kidney, how deep does it go? Um, you know, grade two and grade three being that they only go into the cortex, um, but there's no um, actual um, entry into the collecting system. And then grade four, having an injury into the collecting system, 
and grade five being scattered kidney. So um, there are some other distinctions as well. The presence of a hematoma, whether it's confined to the perirenal fascia or whether you've had expansion of the hematoma into the retroperitoneum or peritoneum as well. And so these are the, this, is, this is what is used to grade renal injuries and then to also help to guide you in your management options. And this is a picture of, of what we just talked about. So this is an actual, so we have normal grade one. You can see there's no renal laceration on that. There's just a subcapsular hematoma. Grade two, there's a small laceration. Grade three, grade three to me looks a lot like grade two in this one, but in general, grade three is supposed to be a greater than one centimeter laceration. Grade four is going all the way into the collecting system or you have more expansion of your hematoma. And then like we said, grade five is basically a shattered or a volsed kidney. Okay, so uh, the AUA released Eurotrauma guidelines both first in 2014, and then those were amended in 2017. And this is not, by all means, this is just two of the different statements. And these are only in regards to renal trauma, but it's to show that there's not a lot of direction about when you need to operate versus not. So in statement four, basically it says if you're, the patient is stable, you should try not to operate on them. And statement five says if they're not stable, you should do something about it. And otherwise we don't have a whole lot of information about when you should operate or not. So absolute indications for surgical intervention and prompt intervention are life-threatening blood loss, as you can imagine avulsion of the renal pedicle. If, if they're in the operating room and you see an expanding pulsatile retroperitoneal hematoma, um, or in patients who have bilateral injuries or a solitary kidney. And then moving on to our relative indications, things like a significant amount of non-viable tissue, if you have persistent urinary leakage, so in those grade four um, renal um, injuries or above, coexisting other injuries that are probably being addressed by the trauma team or avulsion from the UPJ. So um, I think it said earlier on there, but does anyone, I'm not going to ask a bunch of questions because I think it'll be difficult because there's so many of us, but there's two things on this um, IVP that was obtained um, intraoperatively that are important. Um, any thoughts on what those two things are? Because I think one of them is obvious because there's an arrow pointing towards it, but there's a second thing that we're looking for as well. Hi, I'm not seeing any contrast going down the um, right ureter, but it might be just because the picture is small, so I'm not sure if I'm seeing that correctly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so that's part of it. And then there's kind of one other thing. So I think that's important. So you can see that there's clearly on this right side, there's the contrast doesn't look normal. So there's some extravasation. I agree with you that you don't really see a good, um, there's kind of like a mild, you know, maybe a hint of some contrast draining right here. But so that that's one thing. Is there anything else anyone, you know, thinks that we might be looking for on this imaging? Looks like there's like a posterior um, hypolucency, which maybe that's a hematoma. Yeah, potentially. Um, yeah, that, that could be something as well. But the, the other thing that is, is what you will see sometimes is the reason you get one of these is also so you can see that there's a normal contralateral kidney. So these are our patients that did not have a chance to undergo imaging before you go to the operating room. So it's nice when you're looking at someone and clearly if it's a life-threatening situation, then you there sometimes you can't, it doesn't matter whether they have a normal contralateral kidney, but in general, when you get this on-table IVP, you're looking at the degree of injury on the affected side, and do they have a normal kidney on the other side, so that if something happens to this one, you know you you know that there's a normal functioning kidney. So yeah, so I think all those things that you all mentioned were important, um, and so you see the abnormal side, you see what looks like over here on on the left side a, a normal, a fairly normal kidney, from all we can tell, drainage down into the bladder. So so that's important. This is how you do it. You get an x-ray 10 minutes after you do an IV push of uh, two milliliters uh, per kilogram of contrast. And then this is kind of the image you'd be looking at. We're not gonna talk much about surgical management because I think it's a little bit um, beyond um, the scope of what we're doing here today. But in general, it's an abdominal approach. There is actually debate about whether you should get early vascular control or not and whether that's necessary. Um, obviously, 
the thought process ab about if you get it early is that once you open up the retroperitoneum, this hematoma, you no longer have um, the compression from this hematoma that you could start to bleed a lot quickly. And so having a vessel loop or something around your vasculature beforehand is helpful, but there are some people that argue against doing it early on and say that you can do it kind of if needed. Um, but in general, you're going to debreed your non um, uh, viable, excuse me, let's go back here. Debreed the non viable tissue, close the collecting system, reapproximate the parenchyma, and leave drains in place. So that's kind of very like simplified, and obviously there's a lot more to it than that, but those are kind of the main principles that you're going to follow if you do end up trying to repair the kidney. So now we're going to move on a little bit to when is it appropriate to manage these patients conservatively, um, what kind of follow-up do they need, et cetera. So we're going to look at several studies here <clears throat> and just that, that highlight kind of how things, like I said, have changed over the last few decades. So in this first study that we're looking at, um, there were, these are all high grade injuries. So those were the ones where either there's a collecting system, a more significant hematoma or a shattered kidney, things that would have normally um, been managed operatively. And basically they, the majority of these patients did not get operative management initially. And so there were only three and um, who had surgery initially they had non-neurologic injuries as well um, and underwent nephrectomy, but they all had grade five injuries um, at that time. And what they found is that the majority of these patients were able to be managed non-operatively. So all of these high grade injuries did not have, did not require operation, which um, is different than how, again, like I said, how things were um, initially and previously managed. Um, some people did go on to require delayed surgery, 18%. Um, and the things they saw, as you would maybe imagine, are that if there was a higher grade of injury or if they're hemodynamically unstable, those were um, risk factors for requiring surgical intervention. <clears throat> Next study, uh, similarly, is a meta-analysis by Mingoli, and they looked at differences in outcomes between operative and non-operative management. So um, in their, what they found, again, some of this stuff is not very surprising, but this is you know, this is changing how we manage things was that these, that there was high grade renal trauma was more com common in our operative group. Um, Non-operative management was used more commonly in blunt and low grade trauma. So more penetrating trauma got um, operations. And overall that operative management had a higher mortality rate than non-operative. Um, but you have to think obviously there's a reason these people end up in the operating room probably because they either had more severe injuries they had other um, uh, other organ injuries as well, so it's not really surprising that they had a higher mortality rate um, than than the patients who didn't have to undergo an operation. Um, and similarly, uh, within just the high grade renal trauma group, there was an increased mortality with those who underwent operative managements, and probably for the reasons that I just mentioned. This study by Colico looks at the trends, and I'm not gonna to focus too much on the individual numbers, but I think the important thing to take away from this is that everything was moving towards, from these years of 2002 to 2012, was moving towards more conservative management. So there was a significant increase in endovascular repair. So for both a blunt and penetrating trauma, we were moving towards, um, uh, endovascular management as opposed to um, operative management. The rate of nephrectomy has gone down significantly for both blunt and penetrating trauma. And only for um, renorphy um, did it stay stable in penetrating trauma, but decreased in blunt trauma. So again, kind of the take home is that they have seen changes over those years in how people are managing renal trauma. And, and these graphs show the same thing. So we're not, we're not gonna belabor these, but you can see endovascular management going up, laceration, um, uh, excuse me, uh, laceration repair going down, nephrectomy rates also going down. That's for blunt, penetrating, like we said, there wasn't a whole lot of difference in the laceration repair, but nephrectomy rates went down and the endovascular management went up. 
All right, so now focusing just for a minute on the most, most severe of all those injuries, so your grade five renal injuries. And so this, this study looked at, um, by Altman, looked at only uh, grade five blunt renal trauma. So there's not a lot of patients in this, only 13, um, but basically almost 50% in each group as whether they went operative or non-operative management. And what they found was that basically that some of these patients were able to be managed conservatively. So um, the people who had to undergo um, operative management stayed longer in the ICU, um, but again, there was probably reasons that they were being pushed towards operative management. Um, also, there were three deaths in that group as well, which probably is a reflection of their overall just being, you know, having, being more injured. Um, and so um, even in grade five injuries, non-operative management is an option. This is with grade five and those treated with embolization. So another possibility, you know, observation, embolization, basically embolization worked for the majority of these patients. Nobody, as far as they knew, had renal failure. And one patient did develop some hypertension, which can happen. So, I mean, these patients who have significant renal injuries, they do need to be um, monitored and followed as far as their renal function, as well as the, for development of hypertension afterwards. And this is just a picture of a grade five injury. So you can see on here that there's a significant laceration into the kidney. There's a large hematoma around the kidney, and that's what you're seeing. So like the grade five was, you know, avulsion of the kidney, shattered kidney. This is the, the kind of image that you're going to see. Um, penetrating renal trauma, like we talked about, was more likely to undergo operative management than um, blunt trauma initially. But th this, so this study just looked focused at um, renal trauma or penetrating trauma specifically. And um, again, what they found is that they're, they were able to manage um, a decent amount of these non-operatively. And so 32% um, of them with gunshot wounds able to be managed non-operatively with the, with the stab wounds, 81%. And those, when you were able to go ahead with non-operative management, they were able to get out of the ICU faster, lower transfusion rate, shorter hospital stay and shorter mortality. Um, and um, I think, again, the take home is just that that is possible. So not everyone who has a stab wound to the kidney is going to need um, an nephrectomy or even a repair of that, uh, of the laceration. <clears throat> and that's just a graph that shows the same thing. So um, this was, a, you know, so this looks at urinary extravasation and even I can remember as a resident, you know, when coming in to see trauma patients, if they had extravasation, that we would go ahead and put a stent in them at that time, you know, and not wait to see how they um, necessarily fared before we made a decision about whether a stent was necessary. So um, looking at those patients that you see extravasation on when they first come in, so those are gonna again be the grade four lesions or higher. And so what you see is that urinoma can form in up to 7% of trauma patients. And so, these studies looked at patients who had um, extravasation and saw how many of them ultimately required some sort of intervention if they were um, managed conservatively to begin with. And so, as you can see in both of those, in the first one, it looks as 87% of those had resolution without intervention. So never needed a stent, never needed a nephrostomy tube, never needed an open surgery. Similarly, in the second one, um, only 9% had persistent extravasation and required a stent placement. And then even after the stent placement, they had resolution. So they were able to be managed only with a stent. So this certainly argues against having to put a stent in everyone who comes in who has extravasation um, and that you can monitor them and decide whether to put a stent in based on whether their extravasation resolves or whether they develop symptoms of sepsis or you know prolonged urinoma, then you can decide whether they need a stent after that. And here's a, here are pictures of um, from the second paper that was on there of resolution of uh, the extravasation. So we can see right here that in the first the first pictures you see the extravasation 
And then as you move on, these are the later images that there's no longer any extravasation. So this is the same patient and they just wanted to show that there can be a resolution without any intervention. So this person does not have a stent in and they had resolution of their, uh, their urinary extravasation. And then, you know, winding it up is when, when do you need follow-up imaging? Um, does everyone get follow-up imaging? Do you only need it for the patients who have higher grade trauma? And so in this group, they had everyone got repeat imaging. So this one, they had two, 210 renal units. Everyone got repeat imaging within 24 to 48 hours. And what they found is that none of the patients who had low-grade injuries needed any alteration in their care. In three of the cases of grade four, they end up getting a stent. So that would suggest that in lower grade Im injuries, you don't need any sort of follow-up imaging, but in the higher grade ones, you may need to consider follow-up imaging within those first two days. And in this one, they did not do routine imaging in all of them. So some of their patients got routine imaging, some of them only got imaging if they developed signs and symptoms of sepsis. Um, they had um, a decrease in their hematocrit. They were hemodynamically unstable. Then they would get they would get fall, but they didn't just routinely get it. And in this, that they saw that only one percent one percent of patients in the routine imaging group required intervention. And so that's the patients the group of the patients who all of them underwent repeat imaging regardless. And then the group who underwent imaging based on their need. 20% required intervention. So this, again, argues against routine imaging, but more towards either if there's a clinical, a change in their clinical picture, or potentially if they're higher grade injuries, um, then you should consider going ahead with follow-up imaging. So to end all that, um, I know it's a, a lot of information, but I, I think that, you know, the overall message is that things have changed and that lower grade um, blunt or penetrating trauma can be safely managed conservatively, but then also even higher grade ones, if they're hemodynamically stable, um, you should consider trying to manage them conservatively as well. Um, like I just said a moment ago, that routine, routine stent placement is not necessary. Um, also, like we said, low grade, um, uh, follow up for low grade, in, uh, excuse me, follow up for, um, for low grade injuries is not necessary as well. And, oops, sorry, go back. Um, and, and then I think the other thing that's interesting um, is that as more renal trauma is managed conservatively, one of the other thing to consider is that as a urologist, we probably, our comfort level of treating renal trauma operatively will likely decrease. Because I think that even at busy trauma centers, a lot of times, as residents, we don't see a lot of trauma, renal trauma, because either it's being managed conservatively or a lot of times the trauma surgeons will take care of it as well. So um, I think our, our chances for experience with renal trauma and its management operatively are going to become fewer and fewer. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's the talk um, about renal trauma. I'm going to stop sharing that. Okay. And then we're back here. So um, so that's, that's it as far as the lecture is concerned for today. I'm happy to answer any questions about renal trauma, about Emory, about myself, or anything else you have, um, and then we'll go from there. I have a quick question, just yeah. kind of ties in both of the two, but you kind of talked about this a little bit at the end. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious what like the role of the urology team is at Emory with regard to to renal trauma. I mean, you just kind of touched on it, but you know, say say like a patient with some possible renal injury comes into the trauma bay, is there a urology resident there like helping with the fast exam or is it mostly like the trauma team takes care of it and then we get consulted later? I think mostly the trauma team is getting, you know, uh, is doing the initial management and then we get consulted later. Uh, consulted later. Um, I know certainly when I was in, during my fellowship, I didn't do any renal trauma, even at Grady. I mean, again, the, the, Grady is a very busy trauma center. And I mean, it's not that none happened while I was there, but it's that either it was managed conservatively or the trauma surgeons took care of it. Um, and so I think that in general, we are not... Um, 
around from the initial assessment, um, but are called in later. Um, I remember um, Dr. Makinich came and gave a lecture to us, and I think when he was first practicing, the reason he did so much trauma is because he told them that he was going to be on call all the time for trauma and that they could call him whenever and he would come in and help with the renal trauma, which is the reason that they that he did more renal repair because a lot of places just don't do that. I think that a lot of places, for whatever reason, the trauma surgeons um, either, you know, there's maybe not consistent urology assistance or whatever, but a lot of times either they'll just do a nephrectomy um, if they think it's necessary or, you know, we're, we're consulted in later on. So it's definitely something that, I, you know, I, like I said, I, I didn't see it. And in and, and Memphis, we had a fairly busy trauma center as well. And so um, there was very minimal trauma that urology was called into renal trauma. Now we were called in for a lot and bladder trauma and other things, but as far as renal trauma is concerned, there were a lot of times it was just handled by the trauma surgeons and we were not involved until later or sometimes intraoperatively. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Yes, um, go right ahead. Um, uh, hello. Hi, yes, go ahead. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Dr. Harsu, for the for the presentation. I think that Emery has been has took a like a leadership role in the virtual uh, activities uh, from the beginning of the pandemic. Like, I, I don't think I've seen a, a, like any other program start a, a virtual town hall before you guys did, and uh, well, yeah, we truly back. appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, I I got a quick question that's not really related to the to the lecture. I want to okay. ask, uh, how can a medical student who is very interested in urology uh, get involved in urology research if they don't have a home urology program? Like, how, how would one go around, uh, like, looking for a mentor or, or having, like, this kind of uh, relationship uh, in, in the research field? Because... I'm uh, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead and finish. Sorry. No, no. I, I just want to say that like a lot of research is very interesting, but it's it's very hard to get into it if you don't know, like um, if you don't have a home program is, is what I'm asking. Yeah. And so, and I think in situations where you don't have a home program that um, reaching out like in, in ways like this, when you have um, programs that are um, having some sort of virtual platform for to connect with students, then, you know, making those connections afterwards, reaching out to the program to see what opportunities are available. Um, because obviously, if you don't have a, a home program, then that makes things more challenging, um, because you can't do research at your home program. And so um, that's what I would recommend is that, you know, when you when you attend some of these virtual, um, uh, these virtual lectures or town halls that if you find a program that you're interested in, that you reach out to the people who are hosting them, see what opportunities are available and how to get in, involved in research there. Because I think, again, we all know that this is gonna be a certainly a different year for applicants and you know, finding ways to get everyone involved and get the exposure that they need um, is, is a priority for all of us. So, um, so that's what I would recommend. Oh, thank you so, so much for the answer. You're welcome. Dr. Hartzell, I have a quick question about yeah. trauma. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there are any like patient specific factors that we should keep in mind when we're evaluating a trauma for the first time. Like I'm being like congenital uh, unilateral kidney or chronic kidney disease or something like that. But what else should we be asking in our initial assessment that might affect our management? Yeah, so I mean, I think, I think you certainly already brought up some important things because people who have congenital urologic issues, those are going to be more prone to having um, uh, injuries after a trauma. Um, but I think in, in, you know, when you're assessing the initial things you're wanting to look at are, you know, first off, anytime it's a trauma, and I know this because kind of goes without saying, but the first thing you're trying to do is assess the stability of the patient. And assuming the patient is stable, you know, then starting your workup and thinking about things like, you know, what is their overall renal function? Do they have, you know, a solitary kidney, like you said, because, you know, in a case of a solitary kidney where you're potentially going to be putting someone on dialysis, and I think, you know, even still right now, you know, going in, your risk of nephrectomy is higher if you 
if you if you go in and try to operate because um, just because you know once you get in there there's bleeding um, you may be pushed to to do an nephrectomy that they may have not needed if it was managed more conservatively so I, th I think you hit the hit the nail on the head with those things is that you're just you're looking for you know do they have any anatomic abnormalities um, do they have both their kidneys what is their baseline renal function etc and in using that somewhat to guide you, but a lot of what I think this research shows is that what's gonna guide you is just whether you, if you can manage them conservatively, that needs to be what we do for the most part now and only, and save the operative management for those who just are hemodynamically unstable. We can't, you know, we don't have another option. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Dr. Hartzell. I kind of have a question, just a general question about Emory slash Atlanta. Um, yeah. As a person who is originally from the Midwest, um, <laughs> what's your favorite part about living in Atlanta? Oh, um, let's see here. What is my favorite part? I, I actually really like Atlanta. I don't have a lot of comparisons since I'm not from the Midwest, but I will say that um, you know, I'm from Knoxville, which is obviously much smaller than Atlanta, and similarly Memphis is. Um, I mean, I think Atlanta is just, there's so much going on. I, I've become spoiled now and that I think that it would be really hard for me to give up the convenience of being close to so much stuff. I mean, it's funny to talk to my family now and, you know, they're driving 15, 20 minutes to a grocery store and I have four grocery stores within a mile of my house. And, you know, so things like that, but then, then having access to a busy airport, um, you know, having access to really any type of food or entertainment you could want. And Atlanta is, is interesting because even though it's a big city, I think it's, there's a lot of green space in Atlanta. So you don't feel crowded. I mean, well, I, you do sometimes feel crowded when you're on the interstate. Um, but thankfully, I avoid a lot of that because of the times I'm going to work and where I live. Um, but just in general, I mean, I think Atlanta has, it's, it, it just, it has so much to offer because it really is, to me, it's like a complete package of having all the amenities that you find in a big city, um, but, you know, having green spaces, it's close to mountains, it's within driving distance to the beach as well. Um, like I said, you don't really feel, a lot of the time, you don't feel overly crowded and there's a lot of little pockets. So, you know, within Atlanta, there's all these different neighborhoods and within those neighborhoods, they're, you know, they all have their own um, restaurants and bars and parks and stuff. So people kind of hang out within their neighborhood as well. So I do think it has, you know, kind of a, a little bit of everything and have, I was nervous at first to move to somewhere that for me was a, definitely a big city and afraid I would be overwhelmed. But I think I've, I'm now spoiled by it and it would be hard for me to move somewhere else where I, I didn't have access to the same things. Cool. Thank you so much for that answer. You're welcome. All right. Well, perfect. Um, if there's not any other questions, then we'll go ahead and wrap up soon. Like I said, I really, you know, we appreciate your all's interest and, you know, willingness to attend these um, sessions and ask questions and get involved. Um, we are planning on continuing to do these um, for at least the next, you know, two to three months. So there's going to be a variety of different types of lectures. This The second lecture this week on Thursday is going to be actually by one of our PGY-4s, and he's going to talk basically about anatomy of the GU system, different types of drainage, so tubes, nephrostomy tubes, stents, catheters, etc. Um, so that should be a good talk. We have, um, you know, like I said, we have several more faculty members and residents giving talks um, throughout this time. So um, we hope you'll come back again and join us for other ones. Um, if you find, which we, we're hoping that at four o'clock was kind of, it was a time that would be hopefully easier for you all to make because it's a little at the end of the day, but it's not taking up anybody's nighttime. So, you know, feel free to email me if you have suggestions or questions outside of this or something that you think we could offer that would be all helpful to you guys because we're certainly um, open to suggestions as well. Um, and if you got an invitation 
if you were signed up on the email, which I'm assuming you all were because you all had the Zoom address um, and password that you will get, we'll automatically send you information about the future ones. You don't have to, you're like, you're on the list serve now. Um, so unless you want to be taken off the list serve, you don't have to let us know. We, we will send one out to you again. Um, the plan is to hopefully at the beginning of each week, send out the schedule for that upcoming week. So um, thank you. Um, we uh, look forward to seeing you guys more in the future. Uh, I think we also are going to try a little bit later on to have another couple of town halls, probably do another one where it's a meet the resident one, residents one, so that if you all have other questions for, res for the residents as we get closer to interview season, that you'll have the ability to do that as well. So um, stay in touch with us and thank you guys for coming. Have a great night.